A dying question, what is plasmapheresis? I know maybe one or two might know that are in the audience, but um, most people, after 15 years of this program being in the hospital, people still don't know what is plasmapheresis. So my objectives today are the who, the what, the where of therapeutic apheresis department. Um, what is plasmapheresis? What diseases require plasmapheresis? What other treatments are done? And how can the ward nurse help? Including the rationale. And then my conclusion. So what are we? We are nurse three clinicians and we provide the therapeutic apheresis service to all of Manitoba. Our treatments are provided at Health Sciences Centre and St. Boniface Hospital, Monday to Friday, 7.30 to 4, and on call till 8 o'clock, and weekends, we're on call from 8 to 4. Where are we? We are located at Health Sciences on GE545, which is our office. So what do we do? Well, we provide three treatment modalities called leukophoresis. It is used for the acute leukemia. Um, with a high white cell count, usually greater than 100,000. And we, it, it reduces the white cells circulating in the blood. We also do red cell exchange, which is used for sickle cell anemia crisis, also malaria. And it reduces the red cells, blood cells that are sickling, circling in the blood. And then we do plasmapheresis, which, so what is plasmapheresis? It's really simple. Plasmapheresis or therapeutic plasma exchange or plasma exchange, which some of the doctors just call PLEX, is a procedure that removes and separates the plasma from a patient's blood using a centrifugal operating system and it's called the Spectroptia. And that's a picture of the machine that we have now. So this is just a picture of the centrifuge that's just inside the little handle. So this is what is spinning at 2400 RPM revolutions per minute. And this is a picture of when the patient's blood is going into the uh, centrifuge that it is um, se being separated right there. You could see the little pink window is actually the plasma and the blood, the red cell is sitting at the bottom, a little dark line. And then it separates into two tubings that go into the machine. And this is a picture of it getting a little deeper with the blood cell as it rises. And I'll try to get a better close-up with it rising to the top. And in the middle is what is called the buffy coat. It's the red cell is, sits on the bottom and your buffy coat is in the middle and your plasma rises to the top. So that has your platelets in the middle with other solutes. So what is plasma? So plasma is the yellow, watery part of your blood. When spun, the dense red cells settle to the bottom. The plasma rises to the top, and the white blood cell and platelets sit in the middle. And three to four times during that treatment that we give, the, the machine is actually giving that back to the patient. So it is in the plasma, it carries the minerals, the hormones, the vitamins, and the antibodies to various parts of the body that in the bloodstream and this plasma is removed and discarded as it is making the patient sick. So at the same time that we are removing the patient's blood and spinning it, we also uh, have to give back a replacement fluid and because it prevents hypovolemia. So the doctor will order um, either two-thirds, five percent albumin and a one-third normal saline or a hundred percent cryosupernatant plasma or fresh frozen plasma or we now use octoplasma if the patients have a severe allergic reaction to the CSP or FFP. So this is a picture of the plasma that is being collected at the back. There's a big bag there. And with this treatment we're using albumin and, and saline. Plasma is again at the back and we are using actual CSP. So what is being removed? Some diseases can create substances such as proteins, cytokines, toxins, and antibodies which circulate in the body through the plasma portion of the blood and can attack or damage healthy cells or tissues making the patient sick. So more specifically, it is removing the autoantibodies in these autoimmune disorders. 
but the main one that I want to talk about today was the thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, which is called TTP. Because at the same time, we can also replenish plasma factors that is needed in TTP when plasma is used. We also remove the alloantibodies, and we have done a um, one patient that had RH allu immunization in pregnancy. We've done the paraproteins in Waldenstrom's or hyperviscosity, and we've done um, the endogenous toxins, which is the hypercholesteremia or hyperlipidemia. And with this first treatment and every consecutive one, each treatment is 63% of those of those um, circulating substances are removed. So what diseases require plasmapheresis? This is, um, th I'm just going to give you a couple examples of the disorders and examples of what autoantibodies are being removed. So TTP, which is a rare life-threatening autoimmune disorder that is associated with deficient enzyme called ATOM-TS13. It's a protease that cleaves von Willebrand factor with the platelet-rich lambri to prevent hemolysis, thrombocytopenia, and tissue infarction. If this atom MTS is absent, the von Willebrand factor-dependent platelet accumulates, continues, and then eventually causing the microvascular thrombosis. It starts to clot. So plasmapheresis removes these antibodies that are binding the ADMTS13 while restoring the ADMS13 protease activity. So plasmapheresis is generally performed daily until the patient improves and 90% mortality if they do not get plasmapheresis. And it affects one in one to three in a million people. So this is just a picture to show you that with normal blood flow, you get normal hemostasis with the atom TS13. Um, and then once that enzyme is missing, it starts to clump up and clot off. So this is just a blood clot in your vessels that shows the breaking apart causing schistocytes. They call them schistocytes because when they clump and they're speeding through, they crash and burn into each other and they break off little pieces. So once they're broken, they no longer hold your oxygen and they start to clump off. They can stroke, they can have a heart attack, they can get kidney failure. So with myast myasthenia gravis, this disease is caused by the production of the IgG antibodies, the anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies, that attack the acetylcholine receptor of the um, skeletal muscles. These antibodies cause a decrease in the amount of acetylcholine receptors, ultimately decreasing the action potential achieved with stimulation, causing muscular and weakness fatigue. So when they are trying to cross that synaptic thingy there, it, I was telling the patient, it's like crossing a river, and if they can't get across the river because somebody already took their dock, your muscle no longer is moving because it can't reach, can't swim, can't get to the dock. So what we do, we come along and remove those little antibodies sitting in the dock. So that is over there. No muscle contraction. So with good pasture syndrome, this rare disease, also known as anti-glomerular basement membrane disease, primarily affects the lungs and kidneys, leading to rap rapid renal failure. The hallmark of this disorder is the presence of the anti-glomerular basement membrane antibodies. So the antibody is directed toward the uh, alpha-3 chain of type 4 collagen, which is found in the basement membrane of the renal and alveolar cells, so usually found in the lungs and in the uh, kidneys. So, and that's just a picture. It actually goes like a, a lime, light, glowy color, and that's how they can diagnose the... So what we can do is we remove by doing the plasmapheresis these nasty antibodies. Sometimes they get their renal um, function back, sometimes they don't, and same with the lungs. Usually they will still have issues. So, leukophoresis. What is leukophoresis? 
It is known as the white blood cell depletion used for some types of leukemia with a high white blood cell count over 100,000. Very high numbers of leukemia cells in the body may cause problems with normal circulation, so sometimes they could get short of breath because there's just too many. Very high numbers of leukemia cells in the blood may cause problems with normal circulation. <coughs> Chemotherapy may lower that number of blood cells until a few days, not until a few days after the first dose. So in the meantime, the doctors can order leukapheresis treatment to quickly lower the blood cell count, like it lowers it significantly. So this is what happens with um, the blood, like you <coughs> have normal white cells, and then you have cells that are occluding your circulation. Just too many. So this is a picture, it's too bad you can't see it, of a white cell reduction after the pla patient was done where we had two bags. One bag is already separating and you can actually see it. Look and that's all the white cells that we collected. And the second bag is more murky. So what is red blood cell exchange? It is used for patients with sickle cell anemia crisis and malaria. It reduces the red blood cell circulating in the blood. The patient's red cells are removed and replaced by the Opti machine using packed red blood cells specific for that patient. The exchange prevents the removed sickle cells from participating in the new vaso-occlusive events, reducing hemolytic comp complications and provides added oxygen oxygen carrying capacity while decreasing the blood viscosity. So the, um, the normal blood and then the sickled one. So most of them become really short of breath and sometimes they just live with it. But if uh, they're in a sickle cell crisis where the pain is so bad they can't control it or the blood is so thick, then we can do a sickle cell, red cell reduction. So how does this work? First, the treatment is determined by the hematologist on service. The plasmapheresis orders are written. Consent is obtained from the patient by the doctor. They order a central venous catheter and it is inserted. And they consult the apheresis nurse on call and we commence plasmapheresis. Either it's routine which we can do them in the outpatient, or it's urgent. Most of the time it's urgent. So the apheresis nurse on call responds to their page. <clears throat> we take report, we gather certain information needed to start a chart from the ward, from the nurse, from the patient. The uh, order, we order blood product from the blood bank and we introduce patient to plasmapheresis. We complete a patient history assessment and we answer any questions that the patient might have or family. How can the ward nurse help? So to the initiate the first treatment, we need a current height, a weight, and a hematocrit. The rationale to this is these three parameters equal the total blood volume of that specific patient. And that is used to calculate how much replacement fluid that we need. It tells us how much blood to order if we need blood, how much plasma to order if we need plasma, and how much albumin to order. And this is just our actual machine to show you how we do it. If their weight changes, sometimes their weight are, is changing because of fluid shifts, or they're in ICU and they're starting to gain fluid, we still need a new weight because we would still put in a, a, a higher weight, and then that patient gets um, an optimal treatment. So then we need recent blood work. We need CBC, lights, coag factors, we need calcium levels, we need an LGH if they have TTP. <coughs> because this provides us with a baseline. It helps us determine how much calcium gluconate to give to the patient. It helps us monitor hemoglobin, hematocrit, LDH, and it helps us determine if, if our plex or plasma exchange is actually working. The uh, safe parameters for the hemoglobin should be greater than 80, but um, we have done treatments when they were less than 80. The type and screen is required if the doctor orders plasma as the 
replacement fluid. The rationale is it's mandatory for blood bank because uh, they will not release any blood plasma if this is not done and it can delay our treatments anywhere from three to four hours because they have to wait for that to be sent off. They have to, it goes to Canadian Blood Services and then they send it back to Health Sciences or St. Boniface, wherever they are. And if a patient's platelets are sitting at 10, they may not have ours. <coughs> so sign consent from patient. We, um, the rationale, the hematologist to obtain prior to the treatment. So they explain the complications, the risks, the benefits. They're all explained by the doctor and to, so they can get it, obtain the informed consent. We always make sure, make sure, we always ask, was the consent done? We check the chart, consent signed. So the central line should be inserted along with an x-ray and an okay to use order. Sometimes if it's done under fluoro, we don't need an x-ray because it's done under fluoro, but we still need an okay to use that it's safe for us to use. We can also use a peripheral line, but sometimes that won't sustain the, um, the flow rates. Medications. I get the question asked, so what do we do about medications? Well, medications <coughs> should be held, if possible, one hour before treatment, unless they're ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors should be held 24 to 48, and some up to 72 hours, <coughs> which most don't. Most are giving after they're done, but they are held. Some medications have highly protein bound and we will be removed out of, out of the patient, deeming them ineffective. Sometimes the antibiotics, will, if they're protein bound, will be like cleaned right out. It's like, okay. And sometimes pain medication, but um, you have to make sure the patient is comfortable so we will still give pain medication because they usually have an order that for breakthrough pain, so they can always get it after. The blood pressure medications can cause serious hypotension, hypotensive episodes during the treatment, causing delays, causing the treatment to be stopped until it's resolved. Usually they go really hypotensive, like 70s, into the 70s, and um, either we stop the treatment we wait, we can wait five minutes and we give them a bolus of fluid. Sometimes we give them oxygen, sometimes they actually pass out. They usually turn as white as the wall and out they go. And <coughs> so we usually act really fast. But these ACE inhibitors can cause severe reaction and hypotension due to the bradykinin accumulation. So the apheresis nurse will require medications as ordered by the physician. Usually they order <coughs> calcium gluconate, um, one to two grams IV with one repeat, and we usually give that during the treatment at the same time um, as the treatment is running because um, the AC is actually binding <coughs> with the calcium and removed and discarded in the waste bag. So when they have the hypocalcemia, they also get um, signs and symptoms of like perioral tingling. They'll have a low blood pressure. Sometimes they get nauseous, vomit, and so we also give Benadryl. Benadryl is used to treat the allergic reactions to the blood products used in their treatment. And we usually give <coughs> to start off with 25 milligrams right at the start, just in case. <coughs> and usually. Um, during the treatment, sometimes I'll get one little hive, or then we'll give a little bit more. So we usually go up to about 50 if we need to with one repeat. And if we can't control the allergic reaction, usually the treatment is stopped. And if it's TTP, it, they will order um, solumedrol, hang it, and we have to start all over again. So on average, plasmapheresis can take 90 to 140 minutes and the patient should eat and be well hydrated prior to the treatment. <coughs> because you can't eat during the treatment. You can have a few sips of water, but then they have to go to the bathroom and it's hard to go to the bathroom when you're hooked up to a machine. So that's one of the reasons <coughs> why. And also if you eat, your body starts to, um, 
if you eat during the treatment and your blood is out of the machine, your body focuses on digestion. So then all the blood rushes to your, your digestive system and you go hypotensive. So although um, plasmapheresis is considered to be a safe procedure, it is not completely free of potential side effects. And these side effects are citrate toxicity, hypocalcemia, hypotension, metabolic alkalosis, which is usually with TTP patients, infection, or anaphylaxis. So during the treatment, patients are monitored on a one-to-one -one nursing. We take vitals every 15 minutes. They are monitored for signs and symptoms of the citrate toxicity, the hypocalcemia, which is the peroral tingling, hypotension, paresthesia, sometimes they get numbness and tingling in their feet or their, their hands, uh, headache, nervousness, flushing, shivering, nausea, vomiting, chest discomfort. Some people actually feel like their chest is vibrating, which tells us, okay, your calcium is low. <coughs> they get uh, abdominal cramping, both get tetany, laryngeal spasms, probably from the allergic reaction that they're having, cardiac arrhythmias, seizures, and vasovagal episodes where they totally go right out, urticaria, rash, itch, pain, shortness of breath. So we monitor for anything unusual. So after the treatment, vital signs are still done. We do one just post-treatment. And we usually stay um, actually in the room 30 minutes because it takes us that long to clean up and so and then we'll take another one if that first initial low <coughs> was low blood pressure we'll make sure we do not leave the patient until they are safe because uh, the ward nurse doesn't always have time to <coughs> stay with them so we'll, we'll, we'll be there for them mm -hmm. and we don't let them go unless they're in stable condition so we St they usually stay with us for 30 minutes if they're an outpatient. Some patients, if they they like to jump out of bed, I feel great, this is working, and next thing you know, they're hypotensive and they, they're ready to pass out on the floor. And so that's why we usually say, you know what, just stay in bed 30 minutes. Your body has to um, equilibrize. So um, the patient is at risk, though, for bleeding or a hematoma at the vas cath area. <coughs> because we are removing um, clotting factors during the treatment. It is non-specific when they re remove the plasma, everything comes out good, bad. So patient is at risk for um, infection because we are now decreasing their immune system. So because the good antibodies are also removed. So the patient's at risk for blood product reaction post-treatment due to with the Benadryl, sometimes it hides that we give, but we still ask that, you know, you should still monitor for any reactions, any hives, any itching, because they can still get um, hives once we leave. We had one patient that he was perfectly fine through the whole treatment. We only gave, like, 25 of Benadryl. 15 minutes after I was done, all of a sudden, he's going like this. I'm going, oh, are you itchy? lifted up his shirt and he was covered with hot. So um, patients usually feel fatigued, which is normal. They, um, most of them will feel fatigued because your body is still trying to equilibrize what has just happened to them. So this presentation was done to enhance knowledge and provide awareness for patient care during. Each year, thousands of Canadians will re require therapeutic apheresis or plasmapheresis. In 2012, 13,850 plasma exchanges were done in Canada. In um, 2014, 577 plasma freezes were done in Manitoba by us. So, so far this year, we have done 410 plus the one this morning, 411. Mm -hmm. From this year alone, I know I did say one in three of, of 100,000 or 100, a million get TTP, well we had seven patients this year. Seven is a lot. With those seven, they received 142 treatments. The most 
that one patient ever got was in 2004, she had over 110 treatments alone just by herself. Now that's because they're either not responding to treatment, most likely it is not <coughs> responding to treatment. Sometimes they're getting twice a day treatments <coughs> to get um, to remove those antibodies. And um, yeah, it could, sometimes they just don't respond, but we do it until they're responding. You do not stop. Thank you.